Um, so our speaker today is Dr. Joseph Hogan, who is the Carol Lawrence Sirovich Professor of Public Health, Professor of Biostatistics and Deputy Dir Director of Data Science at Brown University. He does a great deal of methodological research in causal inference, missing data, and sensitivity analysis with lots of applications to HIV. And today he's going to talk to us about Bayesian causal inference for HIV care cascade. Thanks, Jean. Um, so I'm going to uh, use my iPad. So I'm going to share the screen off my iPad. And um, I think it's just going to take a second to do that. Um, I'll look at the screen once I'm talking, uh, but I just want to. <clears throat> okay. Um, all right, just give me one sec. I'm sorry for the delay here. There we go. All right. Okay, I think that works. So this is like my new, uh, my new toy. I've been using this for teaching and I learned how to uh, write on it. So <laughs> hopefully, you know, uh, I don't have a pointer and I think that um, every now and then I might just make some uh, jots on the, on the page. So first I'd like to just uh, extend my thanks again for the, um, for the invitation. Um, I am fortunate to know a fair number of uh, colleagues on the Michigan faculty and it's, it's really good to see familiar faces. So thanks again, um, I like probably all the speakers who are in your series, uh, I wish I could be there in person, um, and you know, hope that hope that I can do that at some point soon. All right, so let's see. Oh, my new toy isn't working as well as I thought. Um, so let's see what we got here. All right, so um, I first want to just say a couple things about uh, predictive versus causal inference, and. Um, this has become sort of a, an issue in, in machine learning and, and uh, uh, sort of data science these days. I think that a lot of us in statistics understand the difference, but often <clears throat> predictive inference gets confused with causal inference within big data settings. So when I say predictive inference, what I'm talking about is um, inference concerned with predicting an outcome Y from some set of inputs. And here's just some examples. You know, you might predict failure to show up at a clinical appointment predict presence of fetal heart defect using an image data or something like that. So this is just, you know, inputs are X and the outputs are Y. And a lot of us are used to doing things like this. And uh, predictive rules are usually built using um, regression or machine learning. And in general, the predictive rule might be <clears throat> if we have a binary event, uh, the event might be modeled using some logistic regression, uh, but it could also be a bit more generic. Um, it could be a classification tree, random forest, uh, that sort of thing. So I'm just sort of introducing, you know, the, the notation here, just that to say, okay, this is some notation we'll use for looking at, at a prediction. But by contrast, um, causal inference is usually used to answer uh, what if kinds of questions. And the, the kinds of questions that we might be concerned about are, uh, you know, I have a, a coronary artery blockage, should I get surgery or do something else? Um, that's a what if question because we're gonna be asking ourselves, well, I have two choices now. I can either choose surgery or I can choose a, conser a more conservative course of treatment. And in order to make my decision, I'd really like to know <clears throat> what would happen under either circumstance and then compare those two outcomes. Uh, another kind of causal question is, you know, among individuals that are newly diagnosed with HIV, is it better to start treatment immediately or is it better to wait until symptoms develop? Now, in HIV, for those who follow um, 
sort of developments in HIV, we, we have a pretty good answer for that question. It's, it's pretty unanimous now that we should treat people as soon as they're diagnosed with HIV because we have good medications that don't have such poor side effects, but that wasn't always the case. So again, it, when, you know, I, I, I work with a lot of folks that are, that would classify themselves as data scientists. And I, I think maybe these kinds of distinctions are obvious to statisticians, but they're not obvious to everyone who works with large data sets. Uh, the predictive analog of some of these questions would be, you know, I've got a pile of electronic health records data. And so I'm going to look at, you know, people who received surgery and people who didn't and figure out who had a better 30 day mortality if we're looking at the coronary artery blockage question. Or I could look at a bunch of people who have HIV and see if the ones that were treated early have longer expected survival. So these are ways of doing two sample comparisons. And honestly, in a lot of uh, sort of, you know, in the wild settings, these are how causal questions are being answered by trying to answer predictive uh, questions. So to generate predictive inferences, typically we like to see, you know, for example, X should come before Y. Um, uh, then we get lots of replicates of X and Y from some representative population, and we can use methods to train and validate um, some sort of algorithms. But what about causal inferences? <clears throat> So if we look at the, the following two statements, these can both be simultaneously true. Um, it could be possible that those who receive HIV treatment immediately upon diagnosis have shorter average survival time than those who wait. And we could, that, that's, that's actually exactly the sort of uh, predictive phenomenon you would see if you looked at cohort data in the early phases of the HIV epidemic. And the reason that that's happening is probably if you think about it, um, seems obvious in retrospect, it's because sicker people were getting treated. So if you developed a predictive rule and you just want to generate a predictive rule for survival based on who received treatment and who didn't, you would actually find that those who received treatment survived uh, for less time on average. But the causal question is, given the choice to treat immediately or wait until symptoms develop, um, treating immediately will lead to longer survival on average. That could, that, th these two things can simultaneously be true. So at the time of the decision to, to treat, it could be true that for a given individual, treating is better than not treating. But it can also be true that if I look at a big aggregate set of data where the decision to treat was stochastic, um, in the sense that maybe treatment is being given to sicker people, it could also be true that those who received the treatment survive for less time on average. So this is a classic sort of description of confounding as well, but I'm just trying to sort of draw these distinctions. Um, and again, ease into it too, because I think a lot of statisticians probably, this is intuitive to us. So <clears throat> if we think about predictive versus causal inference, um, it brings us back to the question, so what do we need to make causal inference? Um, the first thing we need is a plausible model of causal effect of exposure or treatment on the outcome. And then um, we need some sort of random as a randomized assignment to the exposure of interest. And absent that, the only thing we have left is assumptions that allow us to mimic randomization. So, you know, I'm teaching a course on causal inference this semester, and I decide that the, the theme for one of the weeks is uh, the title of the, of the readings and the lectures is no causation without randomization. I think that after a long time of applying fancy methods for causal inference and using them and all that kind of thing, I just, I've sort of settled on the fact that you can't have causation without randomization, number one. Maybe this is a controversial thing to say, but number two, that all the things we do in causal inference, statistically matching, inverse weighting, covariate adjustment, whatever you want, is just, we're just trying to mimic randomization. That's, that's what it boils down to. And uh, so I, I tend to, uh, you know, I teach a lot of epidemiology students and there's a philosophy I've been trying to espouse is that 
you should just think of confounding as some violation of randomized assignment. It, it kind of comes down to that. And then the question is, if you use some analytic method or even design method with observational data, how well can you recover randomization? So you can recover probably up to a point and everything else is untestable assumptions. Um, so that's sort of maybe an oversimplification, but I think that that's essentially, you know, a lot of these methods can be boiled down to uh, trying to mimic randomization. So I, um, <clears throat> I've encountered a lot of these kinds of uh, questions in my work with the AMPATH program in Kenya. Um, I've been working with AMPATH for about, uh, I think I'm about 13 years now. And uh, AMPATH stands for Academic Model Providing Access to Healthcare. It's a, a large HIV care program that was started with um, US government funding, um, actually under the uh, George Bush II administration. About $15 billion of funding went into providing HIV care for, uh, for different countries around the world where the, where the pandemic was really getting out of control. Um, for example, at the time PEPFAR was implemented, the HIV prevalence in places like Botswana was approaching 30%. So, um, and PEPFAR has actually made a significant, significant uh, dent, not more, more than a dent really, it's, it's, it has literally bent the HIV curve globally. So in Kenya, um, where HIV prevalence was, you know, hovering in the 15% uh, neighborhood, it's now well under 10% and continues to drop. So in the PEPFAR program uh, that I'm uh, affiliated with, they maintain an electronic health record um, that has data from by now several million clinical encounters. Uh, the, at any given time, there's about 150,000 individuals enrolled in care at over 100 clinical sites. And, and uh, the, the sort of the, the people that the academic partner that launched this particular care program, University of Indiana, had the remarkable foresight to put together uh, a pretty simple but really effective electronic health record that's still going today. So electronic health record data and data from large cohorts in HIV um, are often used to understand what, what's called the HIV care cascade. And the, the care cascade is, it's really, it's a conceptual model and is designed, it, it can be used in a number of ways, um, but it's primarily designed to understand how well things are going in a care program or in a country uh, or in a you know, large population. And it's, the key stages in the care cascade are, um, you know, first to identify people with HIV and that are in the population, link them to care, get them on antiviral therapy, and then keep them in antiviral therapy, on antiviral therapy, so that eventually the virus is suppressed. And, you know, we hear a lot about vaccines for COVID these days. Um, HIV vaccine research is something that's been going on for a very long time. Um, Dr. Fauci, who we're all familiar with now, has been a champion of HIV vaccine research for, for really a couple of decades. And the interesting thing is with all the work with, that's been gone, that's gone into it, we're still not quite there. Um, and so the, you know, the other tool we have to fight HIV is behavioral. That is getting people into care, getting them to stay on their treatment on a regular basis. And not only does this help the individual, but it also prevents transmission. So there's a lot of studies to show that if your virus is suppressed, then you're much less likely to pass the virus to somebody else um, even in sort of unprotected sexual contacts and, um, and other settings where you could transmit HIV. Also, you know, sharing intravenous needles uh, for, for drug injection. So these, these roots of HIV transmission can be sort of uh, cut off if the virus is, is suppressed. And so that's a real important uh, sort of behavioral angle. So the, this is a, a, a picture of the HIV care continuum that I downloaded from aids.gov. And it sort of is a picture of what I just described to you. But the interesting thing, you know, if you, if you look at this um, through the eyes of a statistician, what, what I saw here was a, uh, a multi-stage model um, or, you know, a compartmental model where people sort of pass in and out of these compartments. 
in a longitudinal fashion. You know, you get diagnosed, you get linked to care, you um, stay in care, you get your therapy and so forth. So there's basically these stages you pass through. And, and the, 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 both the policymaker types and the epidemiology types and the clinical types that I collaborate with, they actually want to use this framework to answer a lot of different questions. So in fact, if you just do a Google search on HIV care cascade, it'll bring up an enormous number of papers published in the, in the literature. Um, and I, I think that, you know, the reason I, I sort of divided uh, goals of inference into prediction and predictive inference and causal inference is because you can almost divide those papers into those papers that have predictive goals versus evaluation goals. So on the prediction side, um, a lot of folks are interested in generating predictive models of transition between states. You know, what is it that causes people to drop out of care or not transition to the next state? Maybe for the purpose of flagging people who are at risk for negative outcomes and then intervening before those outcomes happen. But there's also an evaluation side, which I think of as primarily, uh, primarily comprise, comprising causal questions. They could be inference, you know, how do we draw inference about like a policy or a treatment or some kind of exposure? Um, <clears throat> and so the, the, the question that I'm gonna look at today uh, is, you know, for example, was the effect of immediate treatment initiation compared to what I'm gonna call marker-based initiation or initiation of treatment based on following a, a disease marker. So, so researchers have been thinking about the care cascade for a while. This is a, a paper, this comes from a paper by Michael Mugavero, um, who's, uh, I think he's uh, currently at University of Alabama at Birmingham. And uh, this, this one, you know, sort of shows that the just even conceptualizing the cascade can be a little bit complicated. So if you want to think of it in terms of a compartmental model, you see diagnosis on the left, you see linkage to care, uh, but once you're linked to care, you know, we want to retain you in care. And if you look at this sort of, um, so now I'll try to use my fancy uh, marker, maybe I'll be able to. Um, if you look at the, um, th this piece, Oops, maybe I can't. If you look at this piece up here, you see that you know we have people like going in and out of care. So there's a process of people going in and out of care, um, and then also once they uh, sort of um, receive the um, the ART, then they have to once they receive ART, you know they adhere with the treatment, and then maybe they go back to a non-adherent state. So um, so, so the point is that there's lots of transitioning back and forth between states and then maybe overlaid on this, you have to model like, are, you know, are people retained in care? So there's like a lot of dropping in and out, I guess, is the, is the main point. All right. Um, so I'm seeing something in the chat. Does it have to do with uh, how easy this is to see? Is it okay? All right, I'll assume everything is technically going all right. All right. Um, so, uh, so here's a, um, a model of state transitions over time that we're sort of simplifying this a bit. And uh, so here, the, the one, one question that um, we tried to address sort of when, when we were brought this, okay, so, let me back up a second. So some of my colleagues said, well, um, you know, when the HIV care cascade started to be like the thing to talk about in HIV, they uh, came to me and said, well, we want to model the whole cascade and, and look at progression through the cascade. And so the, the deeper we got into this, the more we realized, like, we got to try and break it into smaller pieces. So, um, so first we decided to focus on like engagement and disengagement and care, because it turns out that that's something that was almost being taken for granted. And in AMPATH, people actually come into care, uh, but then they drop out and they, they come back in. So the, the notion of keeping people in care was thought to be really important. 
so here's like a compartmental model. And now we, you know, we've probably seen a lot of these kinds of models with COVID as I was, um, you know, uh, as I was indicating before, like this is sort of the same idea as an SIR model, although it's not a disease dynamic model, but it's a model that describes transition between different states. So if you think of, of, of this as being, um, as representing uh, one step transition, say, between time units we'll define, uh, each arrow represents like transition between states from one time to the next. So for example, you know, this arrow going from engagement to disengagement means that this is a person who was in care today, but then six months from now, they were disengaged. So they, they pass from that. But now when a person is disengaged, they can also come back to care. This arrow represents a person who was engaged today and then the next time we looked, they were still in care. So it's like sort of engaged to engage. And this, this arrow right here, um, this arrow right here actually represents retention in care. So that's something that we'd really like to see. And then other things that can happen are you can transfer out to another care program or there's also mortality. So this is the process that we're gonna try to focus on. And these are the sorts of data that we have to work with. So I'll show you a few pictures of electronic health record data. Um, this is just a bit of a sample. So on the X axis, we have days since enrollment. Um, and each of the solid gray lines is a patient encounter of one kind or another. Some of these are lab visits. Um, some of these are community outreach workers. We have all the encounters and we just mark them all. The dash gray lines are visits or encounters where the person was not taking antiviral therapy. And the solid are visits where the person was taking antiviral therapy. So we have like, we can represent that binary behavior um, at each visit. And then the black dots, if you look at the Y axis, represent CD4 count. So this particular person, their CD4 count was going up, um, then it started to drop. And you know, in this region right here, I don't know exactly for this patient, but what's probably happening is that they're, they've either stopped adhering with their therapy or they might have developed drug resistance. Um, they take like a little bit of a treatment vacation in this period and then maybe get switched to another therapy. That's, a, that's you know, that this is a sort of pattern you see quite a bit. And then the colored coded um, intervals here are what we use to determine whether a person's engaged in care or not. So one simplifying assumption we made is that we set out uh, 200 day intervals because patients were supposed to be coming in um, at least once, at least once per six months. And so green means that there was a visit in that interval. Um, and then red means there's not a visit in that interval. And then sort of the, this is like missed one visit, darker red means missed two visits, even darker red means missed, you know, sort of you're dropped out of care. And then finally, this line right here is the end of follow-up for the data set we have. So we have people that were enrolled that not everybody was enrolled for 3,000 days. We have like a, you know, sort of a, a large cohort. So here's another patient. We only had, you know, 1,200 days of follow-up for this patient. They had three visits, one CD4 count, um, and then they dropped out of care. So that the color code again is sort of their stage. And then, you know, we get, this is just now just throwing up four patients. So what I'm showing you here is that this is, this is four patients out of, I don't know, I think we had 90,000 people. So our, our data set is essentially 90,000 copies of graphs like this, if you want to think of it that way. Um, yeah, so I'll say one other thing, you know, the other sort of state is right here. This is a person who died. The blue color means that they died. Um, so that's another state you could be in. So what you can see here is that we, we try to take what I think is a fairly complicated data set, and I'm only showing you three variables. Um, 
And, you know, we simplified the problem a little bit. Like we discretize the time axis. Um, you know, some people who do like empirical process theory might say, well, why do you make everything continuous? Um, and my answer would be, you know, life is hard enough as it is with this data set. So let's simplify some things that we can simplify. But there are like Dave Glidden, for example, at um, UCSF has actually worked out a continuous version of the problem that a continuous time version of some of the stuff we're doing. So, so these things, these ideas can all be extended, but this is, you know, how we were trying to approach it. So I'm going to skip this part. Um, <clears throat> so our analytic approach was that, you know, we organize data into states and I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, so we want to, you know, we, we, we want to do some, we're going to eventually do some causal inference. And so one, one philosophy that, that I'll try to espouse here is that um, we're going to first fit models to things that we can see, and then we're going to use those models to then extrapolate to things that require assumptions. So in other words, we're not going to wrap everything into a big causal model. We're going to do things separately. We're going to fit the predictive models first and then use the predictive models and fit them into a causal framework. That's essentially the strategy. So we're gonna specify a model for the observed data, which will characterize transition between states, dependence of transitions on covariates, and actually also a longitudinal model for the covariates. And then we're gonna use this fitted observed data models and fit them into a larger causal modeling framework. So, Here's some um, just descriptive statistics. And I can see, I don't know why this happened. There's a typo here. So this should be less than uh, and less than. So um, what we, this is just like a transition matrix where we've aggregated all the transitions over time. And we have uh, say the state at time J minus one can be engaged, disengaged, transferred or died. The state at time tj can be all those same things. And the numbers you see on the table are transition probabilities. And again, it's just all I did was aggregate all the data over all the time points just to get a rough sense of, of the rates. Um, so this number here, for example, if you read across, of the people who are engaged at time t minus uh, time j minus one. 85% were engaged at time TJ. So you've about an 85% retention rate from visit to visit. And then about 13% were disengaged and about 1% of the, those who were engaged uh, died. If you were disengaged previously, then you had a 94% chance of being disengaged the next time we took a look. So this is something that's, you know, uh, sort of an issue. It's like once you drop out of care, it's, it's not likely that you're coming back. And this is a problem that a lot of care programs would like to solve. So we can put these numbers on the graph. All I'm, all I'm trying to show you is that that table corresponds exactly to this sort of arrow and bubble plot that we had before. So you see that 85% retention is on the left there, 13% uh, dropout rate from visit to visit, but then also like a 6% uh, return to care probability. So it turns out that you, you can model the transitions over time if you make some simplifying assumptions. And so this is a bit of the backbone of, of what we've done. Uh, the SJ, um, these are multinomial states at time j, and you can be disengaged, engaged, transfer out, or died. So I've, I've labeled them with numbers, but this is not ordinal. This is multinomial. We have some vector covariates, xj, uh, some of which are time varying. And I know there's, there's a lot of subscripts in this particular uh, expression down here, but you know, this is, we're just going to model the probability that you're in state L at time j, given that you were in state k at j minus one, conditional on covariates. So it's just a standard uh, state transition model using multinomial distribution for longitudinal outcomes. That's essentially what we're 
what we're doing. We're essentially taking the table that I showed before and now this table here and fitting regression models for each of these transition probabilities. That's essentially what's happening. So the first thing you might reach for is just, you know, a multinomial regression, a, a, a relative risk regression using multinomial data, where you have like a, you know, sort of a reference category and you model relative probability of transitioning to category little l relative to a reference and use covariance to do uh, that prediction. And I didn't write down the whole formula, but once this model is fitted, uh, what you get out of that is these probabilities. So you could, for any transition at any time point you're interested in, for a fixed set of covariates, you can write down what the transition probability is. So you might be interested in this kind of regression model in its own right. Um, if you're an epidemiologist, you might be interested in just understanding how these different covariates relate to tra transitions. Um, these, are the, these are some of the covariates we've used. Uh, CD4 count, which is time varying, viral load, height and weight, um, HIV stage, higher is worse, and so forth. So you can see there's a lot of things that we might want to include in a, in a model like this. And if you were to go and fit the model, um, you might get something like this. Uh, these are log relative rate ratios. I'm trying to remember from my <laughs> generalized linear models class. But you know, just reading off here, um, I guess first thing I'll confess, I've done what the American Statistical Association tells me I should never do and start these little estimates with uh, uh, to, to flag which ones are statistically significant. So, this is really just a summary though. Don't read a lot of inference into this. I just didn't want to put all the standard errors up here as well. But what we see is, for example, um, if you start out in the engaged state and you are older, um, the older you are, the less likely you are to go missing. Um, if you're male, the more likely you are to go missing. So this is a predictive model. It also just tells us some associations. Um, <clears throat> if you are a person that uh, had a high CD4 count at the last visit, meaning you were healthier, you're less likely to go missing. If you're male, you're more likely to be subject to mortality. Um, if you're married, you're less likely to be subject to mortality and so forth. So you know, these are not causal effects, these are just associations, predictive effects. So, <clears throat> um, so we fit a multinomial model. Um, this version has linear covariate effect, it has a lot of covariates. And what we eventually wind up doing is using something more flexible. You can use machine learning techniques to have something more flexible. So we're going to now go from predictive to causal models. But we're going to use the predictive models in the service of the causal models. So we're going to use what's called uh, G computation, which is essentially an extrapolation method. It's really, it's like an imputation method. If you think about causal inference, um, just to give you a quick idea, everybody's assumed to have two potential outcomes. I think this is something that's familiar to a lot of us. Um, you only get to see one of them. And what the G computation does is it predicts the other one. That, that's the G computation uh, algorithm in a nutshell. So, um, so we're, we use the predictive models uh, to, to sort of to, to generate predictions of the missing potential outcome. And the validity of the inference, what got us interested in using something more flexible is that because the G computation algorithm relies heavily not only on assumptions about uh, like treatment ignorability or random allocation within covariate levels, but it also um, 
relies heavily on this assumption that the predictive models you're using are correctly specified. And when you have a multinomial model over many time points with a lot of covariance, that actually becomes tricky to think about, like what is the correct specification? And so this motivated us to use a machine learning technique uh, known as Bayesian additive regression trees for the predictive components. And you know, one thing we learned, and I'll just say something about the Bayesian additive regression trees, I'll say something about it in a minute, but there's not a lot of good software out there for fitting multinomial Bayesian additive regression trees. So that's, that's a project that um, my former PhD student, Yijin Chu, uh, basically solved while she was a student. So, um, so the causal question is now, <clears throat> we're moving away from the predictive question, but we're gonna use the predictive models. The, the causal question is, let's suppose I think about two policies. One policy is I treat immediately upon enrollment. And policy two is I treat when CD4 falls below 350, which until about five years ago, uh, maybe, no, maybe less than five years ago, was the norm in the developing world. So, um, so the outcome is gonna be state membership probability at each time interval. So we're essentially gonna fit a causal model to this uh, sort of mini cascade that we've created. So the causal structural model that we're gonna look at, I know it's, sometimes it's hard to get these notations down, but this is about the most concise thing I could come up with. Um, so SJ is state membership, little a is treatment assigned at time J. Um, you can think of it as treatment policy. And it's a sequence of indicators of whether you're on treatment or not. So for example, the treat immediately would be this regime. It means I would turn on the treatment right away and I would just continue to keep the person on treatment all throughout. So um, we want to compare two different regimes. One is the regime let's call it a bar where I, maybe I treat immediately and then I might have another regime, a star, which is treat when CD4 falls below 350. And I just want the probability distribution of these state memberships. So what we need to estimate the causal models is we need a collection of predictive models in order to make this work. So, um, so I'm using the same notation. Uh, I'm distinguishing now between time varying confounders X um, and V, which are baseline confounders. And I'm gonna gloss over the assumptions because this is a talk. And I'm gonna say assumption number one is no unmeasured confounders. What that means is that at any given time point for two people having the same covariate profile, we're gonna assume whether they receive treatment is essentially a random allocation. And we're going to assume first order dependence for S and X. That's a big assumption, actually. Um, so we're going to assume, you know, this state transition model, but we're going to assume that there's only first order dependence in the state transition model. That, that can be relaxed um, by just elaborating the model. Okay, so the G computation um, algorithm is, is, as I said, it's an extrapolation. Um, so what happens here is that uh, the G computation takes a predictive model. This is like the multinomial regression, the prediction of say state at time one, um, conditional on say baseline CD4 and baseline covariates. We fit a predictive model to S given capital A, capital A is the actual treatment you received. Um, but now what we want to do is we want to use that predictive model to generate extrapolations to say, what's the predicted state assuming you receive the treatment? We essentially plug in treatment equals one, and then we generate, we generate predictions of the state under treatment equals one. And then we average that over the observed covariate distribution. So people like this because essentially you just plug in predicted quantities and take the average. So to do this, this seems like a fancy integral, but if you just plug in the observed covariates and take a sample mean of the predictions, that accomplishes what you're trying to accomplish. You're essentially just taking a, an average over the, the individual specific predicted values. That's the extrapolation part. 
Now, when you extend this to um, longitudinal setting, what happens is you have to have a series of longitudinal predict predictive models, but then you're going to plug in uh, the covariate process to get the prediction. So you now need a model of the covariate process in addition to a predictive model for the outcome. So let's suppose your target is, you know, we're just going to look at two time points. Um, and we specify a treatment regime. Now, these are things that we fix. So we could say that, you know, we want to look at a treatment regime where at the beginning they don't receive treatment, but then they do receive treatment, something like that. We fix that. So I know this looks really like a lot, but essentially the point to keep in mind here is it's just going to be a series of sequential predictions. Um, we start by plugging in the fitted models, one for time one and one for time two. We also plug in a fitted model for the longitudinal covariates, that's CD4. I'm not saying much about that, but it's there. We fix the treatment regime that we're interested in learning about. So we, like I said, we could say that this equals zero and this one equals one. We just plug those values in, which means I plug in a zero here and a one here. And once I plug those values in, I'm just going to take averages over all the covariates. Okay, so then I average over the specific population of interest. So um, what you'll notice is that, you know, I predict S1, then for the given treatment and the given S1 that gets predicted, I next predict X1. I take X, the predicted X1, and plug it in here the predicted S1 and plug it in here and then generate a prediction of S2 based on, on that. So it's really just a series of like predict the covariates, plug them into the next prediction equation and keep on going. Okay, so how do we implement this on the electronic health record data? So, um, I'm not convinced this is the absolute best way to do it, but this is how we looked at it. So first we did, uh, we trained, so-called trained a model. We have, a, we have a sample size of about 75,000 individuals with longitudinal measurements. Um, first we fit the model on about 50,000 individuals. Then we looked at whether this model gave good predictions. That's key. We wanna know that the predicted model is, is doing something um, correctly. And then in step three, we essentially, once we have the predicted models, we think of those as like an input to almost like a systems model. So, you know, we've constructed our, our causal model about how the covariates and the treatment affect progression. We fit in, we put our statistical objects, that is our, our sort of fitted models, and then we basically just simulate outcomes uh, from this from this system. So for the outcome models, um, we use multinomial Bayesian additive regression trees to fit the multinomial models given the time varying CD4 and the baseline covariates. And we have, you know, we have a list of like 15 covariates. And then we also have time varying covariate models for CD4. CD4 is continuous. We also use Bayesian additive regression trees. And, and the reason we're doing everything in a Bayesian way is because at the end of the day, you know, we could simulate from this big system model. It's all based on a likelihood. We all get sort of, we get proper posterior distributions, posterior predictive distributions. So given the time, I think I might skip over the, um, the Bayesian additive regression tree. Um, the only thing I'll say is this, is that Bayesian additive regression trees are actually parametric models um, in the sense that you have an outcome Y, you have a prediction function G, which is essentially a tree-based prediction, but then you have an error term E. And in most formulations, the error term um, has a normal distribution. So the Bayesian additive regression tree is a very flexible machine learning technique, but 
it has a likelihood representation, which is, I, at least to my way of thinking, it's very, very appealing. It's not just a machine that's like, you give it some X's and it spits out Y's. It spits out predicted Y's that have a posterior predictive distribution that you can formally characterize. That means you can talk about the uncertainty, uh, prediction intervals, and so forth. So just think of it as like, it's a very highly flexible tree-based method. Um, I sometimes think of it as like the Bayesian version of random forest, which is not exactly correct, but it's, it applies some of the same principles. And I'll also say that, um, that Ejin Shu, who's, uh, uh, who graduated her PhD from Brown, is now a postdoc working with um, Scott Zeger at Johns Hopkins, She's, she's the one who developed the machinery for fitting Bayesian net to regression trees for multinomial data, uh, which, you know, <laughs> anybody who works with multinomial data, tree-based stuff and Bayesian things can probably appreciate that this is a fairly heavy lift. Um, there was a software package out there at R that really, um, it's actually been documented that it doesn't work that well. And, and Ejin not only re-engineered the algorithm, but she, um, you know, proved that her algorithm had uh, sort of better convergence than the one that was out there um, and also tuned it so that, you know, it doesn't matter what the reference category is as far as accuracy of prediction. So there were a lot of sort of quirks with this existing package that she fixed and um, it's a really nice piece of work that she came up with. So here we're just looking at whether the predictive models work well. Um, we want to predict percentage, these are cumulative, uh, uh, these are percentages at, at, at each time point of engaged, disengaged, transferred out and died. The blue dots are observed data. The red is posterior predicted means and uh, posterior predictive intervals. And it, we were reasonably satisfied with the fit of the model, the predictive components. Um, then we used, then basically we took this is the part that I think is we probably, as we tighten this up, um, we can do differently. In order to make this simulation apply to the population we're interested in, we just took a random draw of 10,000 individuals and simulated outcomes for them. I mean, it turns out that, you know, 10,000, 5,000, all of them, it doesn't really matter. I mean, you could put in any X distribution you want and then simulate outcomes. So we, you know, we happen to divide up the, the data set into like the training set, the test set, and now the, sim, you know, the extrapolation set, if you will. Um, the extrapolation set though can use really any distribution of X's. So the way the question we're answering is what if there's 10,000 new patients and we wanna compare what happens under the two regimes. Um, All right, so this, um, the thing to pay attention to here is this sort of this turquoise line. So one thing that uh, you can look at is if you look at the policy tree when CD4 is less than 350, this gives you transition probabilities for um, going from uh, engaged to engaged, say that's what this turquoise line is, over time. And what we found out is that it's early on in the process where people have the highest risk of dropping out. So it's really right after you're engaged in care, right after maybe you're put on treatment that you have the highest risk of, of dropping out, if, if this is the regimen. And under the treat immediately, when we do the simulation of outcomes under that particular dynamic regime, we find that it's still the highest risk period, but the effect is blunted. and um, yeah, okay, so I'll just leave it at that for now. So the sort of uh, outputs that come from these models can look like this. You know, we can look at state membership. Let's suppose we do, you know, treat if C4 is, is less than 350. I don't, I'm sorry, I switched colors here, but black is engaged, red is disengaged. You see this, excuse me, precipitous drop early. But this is what like a, a program might expect in a cohort of 10,000 people, you know, um, this is 2000 days out. So that's like several years out. Uh, what proportion of the people who enroll will still be engaged? So there'll be some proportion, uh, a, a large portion that are disengaged and also there's um, some uh, 
proportion of mortality. And it's, I can toggle this back and forth, but you know, if you look at this one, the red, there's a lot more red. And if you look at this one, there's a lot less red. So, you know, if you're communicating to the director of the AMPATH program, toggling back and forth is pretty much uh, a good thing to be able to do, like to just communicate the results. But, you know, because we're statisticians, um, we want to know something about the inference. So these are, this is the causal treatment effect. And what, what's happening here is on the x-axis is time, zero to 2,000 days. On the y-axis is difference in percent engaged. So we're not doing transition probabilities. We're actually looking at the percentages. So what we see here is that, um, you know, number one, the tree immediately gives us you know, a, a much higher percent engaged. But the other thing that's getting reflected is because we have less and less data, more and more extrapolation at the end, these posterior predictive intervals are much wider as you go further and further out. And we can do the same thing with disengaged from care because these are all below zero, that means you have a lower percent disengaged under the treat immediately regime. Um, we can do something similar with mortality. There's not a lot of difference. Um, I just will say that mortality in these settings tends to be underreported uh, because it's once people, sometimes when people drop out, it's hard to tell what fraction have died. So there's a lot of important work being done by uh, Constantine Nutsis and George Bakoyanos at IU on this exact problem, the business of, you know, how to correct underestimates mortality, what they do is they use like, they have follow-up samples. It's almost like double sampling, which is an idea that dates back to the 70s. Um, sort of follow-up samples on those who have dropped out and then use those samples to update the mortality uh, estimates. So the substantive conclusions um, say that uh, there's a strong benefit to treating immediately from a programmatic point of view. Um, I talked about the disengaged finding. Essentially what Constantine and his colleagues have found is that uh, mortality among those who are disengaged, uh, classified as disengaged can be as high as 20%. So that there's a, there should be a, a definitely an adjustment um, for that. And then sort of more globally, um, you know, this idea that electronic health records hold a lot of promise for a lot of different kinds of inferences there's a big distinction between predictive and causal inference. I think I've tried to cover that. Um, and I guess I would, I would say that, um, you know, on this modeling, there's a sort of a, a cartoon that I've, I thought I had a picture of it, but I don't think I do. So you can make an axis for some of these models. Here's, um, uh, say the complexity of the model um, let's see, now I'm trying to remember how I did this, but essentially, uh, you know, statistical models have, um, let's call this like fidelity to the data. Um, statistical models have a lot of fidelity to the data, but are relatively not complex. Big systems models like the SAR models that we've seen for COVID are very, very complex, but sometimes use data from a lot of different sources and are not like richly saturated and observed data. So, you know, you could think of maybe there being an axis here where different models fall along this axis. So in HIV, there's a lot of like sort of complex systems models that people use, like infectious disease dynamic models or just systems models for how people even pass through the cascade. There's also a lot of statistical models that are fit to the data, but aren't that complex. Like logistic regression isn't really that complex. And, you know, I think what we're trying to do is something out here. Um, we're trying to have models that, you know, remain faithful to the data, but have some increased complexity. So it's really like, how do you put sort of high resolution statistical objects into a complex model? For us, the high resolution statistical object is like, the Bayesian additive regression tree uh, fit to the multinomial stage of change data. Um, so, you know, we would like to see where that fits uh, in, this, in this scheme. And I can say like with COVID, 
one problem I'm working on right now is that, you know, we have a group of people in Rhode Island who have a big, you know, sort of statewide epidemic model. It's informed by lots of different sources. The model complexity is very high. I would say it's not super faithful to the data. We're, I'm working with a couple of students on a model that predicts at the individual level who winds up in the hospital after they get diagnosed from COVID. So that's like a high resolution data model that has a lot of fidelity to the data, but it's not complex because it's only one piece of the big epidemic picture. And so the thing that we're talking about is like, how do you take that statistical object and fit it into a bigger model um, that's very complex? Some parts of it are close to the data, other parts are not so close to the data. So that's why, as I said, we're trying to operate in this kind of space here. So I guess I would just like to close by saying, you know, uh, this work that I've been doing um, is motivated by the HIV epidemic in Kenya. And I think I mentioned that I've been collaborating with people there for about, so since 2007. So um, not only are, are uh, not only am I interested in the research questions like I've talked about here, but we also have been doing capacity building for a long time. And uh, we've built a, so a team of Kenyan statisticians and uh, data managers were trying to basically have, you know, a, a biostatistics unit uh, at AMPATH, a research grade biostatistics unit comprised of faculty and staff. And, and so uh, this person here, uh, Anne Wongi, uh, received her PhD from Brown in, in 2011. She's now a tenured associate professor at Moy University and heading up uh, a lot of the biostatistics research there. And the other folks you see there are people that some of them have trained at Brown as part of our, our training program. Others have been getting on the ground training. Uh, but I go to Kenya, uh, not, well, obviously I haven't been there since January, but I go about twice a year. And, and this is really, you know, it's been sort of a career defining uh, kind of set of activities. And I just I wanted to share that, uh, you know, that's where, that's where all this comes from. So. Uh, definitely a labor of love here um, and, and, you know, uh, hoping to get back there soon. But I want to also recognize colleagues that are involved in this work in both in, in the scientific side and also putting the, the data together. And so here is a list of collaborators. You might know some of these names, but they come from really all over North America and Kenya. So um, I'll stop here. Uh, hopefully, I know I've gone right to the bottom of the hour here, but um, I tried to put a lot in there and I uh, just want to say thanks again for your for your attention and I'd be happy to if there's time for questions be happy to take them. Thank you so much. So uh, we have been and I think it's maybe good for people. So we we have been taking a five minute leg stretching break um, between the seminar and having a discussion. So I encourage anybody who wants to uh, join the discussion to stick around. Um, but take a break, stretch your legs, go to the bathroom. Um, and, and when we come back, we can do some questions if, uh, that works for everybody. Sounds good. Oh, we'll be back in five minutes or so, 435. All right.
Hi, everybody. Welcome back. We'll just uh, hang out and wait for Dr. Hogan to get back. Um, okay, I am here. Ah, good. Hello. Um, yeah, so we'll just I left we'll the open slide, it up. Uh, oh, sorry. I left the slides up, but I could take them down too. Uh, whatever, whatever you prefer, I think is is fine. Um, so we'll open up to, to questions. I just wanted to encourage students if you have questions, please don't don't let faculty uh, take over all of the time. If you have uh, questions that you would like to ask. Um, although I think I think there is something in the in the comments. So if we wanted to start there, that would be fine. Uh, okay, let's see. Is it? Any reason compared to the immediately treat statistic of static treatment sequences? Uh, so first, of all, so, and then it asks about uh, dynamic regimes. So the um, so we're we're actually comparing a static regime to a dynamic regime. I didn't go into the. I probably should have gone more into the definition of the regime, but um, so treat so the timing of this is goes like this. The motivation for doing this. There were um, at least a couple of clinical trials looking at whether we should treat immediately upon diagnosis. And those, those trials were done on, uh, you know, people really around the world. And now that um, in places like Kenya, at the time those trials were being conducted, the treatment policy for initiating treatment um, was to, uh, was essentially to say, well, let's just wait till a person, you know, crosses a certain threshold on their CD4 count. Now, at the time we started this analysis, the policy was changing. The, the immediate treatment was starting to be implemented, basically because this is what the WHO was recommending. But, you know, we had all this historical data. And I think as a, you know, as a causal inference question, as a programmatic question, um, the you know, both clinicians and the people who run the program want to know, like, is this going to make a difference? Um, and I think people sort of broadly assumed it would, but this is a, it was an exercise to quantify what the difference would be. So essentially, we're going back and saying, you know, what if we had started treatment immediately? Because there were, there were enough people in the data set that actually did start their treatment right away. Um, so we could do extrapolations for that regime. The dynamic regime is actually pretty easy to simulate um, in this setting because we're simulating the evolving CD4 count. You know, first, first we make a model for the CD4 count. So yeah, I guess the step is, you know, first make the predictive models for the outcome, predictive models for the covariance. Those are like two statistical objects. You fit them, you get them up and running, and there they are. And now you go back and you say, okay, here's my causal model, and I'm going to fit the statistical models in here to sort of generate potential outcomes under these different regimes. So regime one was treat immediately. So we just fix treatment status equal to one from beginning to end. And we're essentially just going to use our fitted outcome model and fitted covariate model to just predict what would happen if we fix treatment to be equal to one the whole time. For the dynamic regime, it's not really, it's not any more complicated. When we simulate the CD4 count, we look to see if it's above or below 350. If it's above 350, the regime stays off. And if it goes below 350, we just flip it on. So, uh, so we're a lot, we, you know, we can simulate pretty easily under that regime too. Um, and then, and then just do the comparisons. So the, the motivation for the static regime was because that was the WHO recommendation. And the dynamic regime was the current regime that AMPATH was using at the time the recommendation came down. So those are the two policies we were comparing. Thanks. Hi, Jeremy. Uh, something. <laughs> Hi, Jeremy. So if I, would, I don't know, you took your slides away, but. Oh, I can put like them back if you want. The dry, I mean, it seems like the driver of this decision would be sort of a treatment effect, right? And yeah. So can you, and I'm just curious, can you see that by just looking at that simple regression coefficients that you were getting out of fitting your multinomial regression models? I mean, I, I know your machinery gives you much more sort of marginal and causal effects, but would you be able to, does it, 
Um, that's driving it, right? Presumably, I don't know what those yeah. features are. So let me just, uh, I have to start up this sharing again. All right, well, I should say while he's doing this, Joe's spent his sabbatical in Kenya. So I've seen a great picture of him and his family, little kids walking around the streets in yes. <laughs> See, it was, it's very, very yeah. impressive to take his whole family yeah. there for a year, maybe. Uh, yeah, it's true, we did do that. Um, and uh, the kids were actually in school even. Um, we still have uh, pictures of my young kids in Kenyan school uniforms. Um, the, uh, let's see, so the, you know, the, I don't know if I can find a slide that would help answer this question, but I think the short answer is we could, um, let's see, can we get this from the regression? I mean, I think if we, you know, we, I'll just go to the table here. Maybe that would be helpful. So we actually have um, on this one here, let's see, previous ARV. So that's- uh, Are you showing it? Am I showing it? It should be up there. Maybe it's not up there. Um, I'm not sure what happened. You know what? Oh, you know what it is? Hold on. Uh, you know what would be easier? Let me just uh, share it on my computer. I just got this iPad last week, so I'm kind of excited to use it, but it does things like turns off on its own. I think there's a setting that must allow it to stay on, um, but I haven't figured that out yet. But let me just get the slides here. All right. I'll go down here. Okay. So is this visible? Yes. Okay. So I won't be able to write on this, but uh, yeah. Okay. So here's the regression model. Um, so, it, you know, I think that uh, this is just for one period of time. I think that we could sequentially look at this, I guess, you know, this, if you look at previous ARV, that's essentially whether you're on ARV, yes or no. So I think we could look at it at that level. Um, I'm not sure that there's an obvious way to, you know, compare regimes over time. Right. Um, so, you know, just for this, I, you know, it's funny, I didn't pull this out for the purpose of comparing the regression, but it seems to be consistent with the overall message. That is, you know, if you're previously on ARV, at this particular time point, you were less likely to move to the disengaged state. Um, and you were also it looks like, uh, well, you're more likely to transfer out. That's sort of a strange finding, but, um, and mortality is lower. I think that, um, <clears throat> you know, I engage in care, I guess also, this is a question I thought you were gonna ask. Um, it's not a hard outcome, right? In the sense that it's not viral load. Um, and what we were hearing from people on the ground is that when, when, um, when people came to the clinic and they weren't prescribed treatment, they felt like, oh, well, I'm fine. And they didn't come back. Um, but when they were prescribed treatment, they thought like they had to come back and get it refilled. So uh, it's, not, it's not treatment acting directly, like you know, mechanistically to lower viral load or something like that. It's more like it, it is a comparison of a policy um, as opposed to a causal mechanism of curing people or, or keeping their viral load at bay. So, um, so I don't know. I don't know if this answers the question though. I think we could look at sequential regression models like this and they should align with the overall message. But if we want to compare the policy as it plays out longitudinally over time, I think we do need the, the causal, we do need to be fitting a causal model or simulating from a causal model is, is, is really what we were doing here. So I'll, I'll jump in with a question, I guess. Sure. I now I'm noticing I can't see the chat. I still am not yeah, a Zoom, okay. so uh, just, not a Zoom just, guru yet. Uh, so I was wondering about issues related to positivity. I mean, I think technically we like to sort of restrict ourselves to individuals who know the levels of treatment that, that are under consideration. 
Um, so, but you have a lot of treatment things here. So doing something that's non-parametric, I think might be tricky. So is your homophobia and assumption kind of playing a role here? Or right. Not that or? Um, no, we didn't, you know, that this is the danger with G computation is that, uh, you know, you're extrapolating without really getting any evidence one way or the other about whether positivity holds. So for example, <clears throat> if you're, let's suppose you're doing inverse probability weighting with propensity scores. Um, if you have weights that are really big, what that's telling you is that there's a covariate profile. So a big weight is a small probability associated with the treatment that the person received. Right. So um, if you have a, if you have a big weight, that means you have a person who received a treatment that rarely would be received for their covariate profile. So you're sort of over leveraging that person, you know, to represent say, suppose it was a person who got treatment, but their covariates indicates that they shouldn't. Um, you know, you're using that, you're over leveraging that person's information to stand in for uh, other people with that covariate profile. Um, I guess the, you know, the assumption, the, the, the positivity assumption is sort of qualitatively assessed here in a sense that there aren't any, under either of these policies, there wouldn't be systematic exclusions for, for getting treated or not treated. Um, so, yeah, I guess the one that I could think of would be if, you're, if your viral load was undetectable, you know, you shouldn't be taken off of the treatment. Um, but yeah, I mean, the point you're bringing up is a good one because it's, it's not an assumption that we, we really paid a lot of attention to quantitatively. Like we didn't do a lot of empirical investigation to see if we had very sparse categories, for example. Yeah, I mean, I think in practice with this many treatments, you, you might never meet it sort of non-parametrically. You'd have to kind of make some assumptions and sort of see how likely, you know, where, where the likely cases are, whether they're not. Yeah, although there's, um, yeah, I mean, I guess you say there's a lot of treatments, but it's only really two choices at each time point, you know? Yeah, but how many time points? Yeah, yeah, if you want, right, if you're thinking about like a regime, yeah, yeah. but I but I kind of think of it more though as positivity has to hold sequentially, not globally. So okay. it's 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 at, at each time point we're making a sequential. Right, well, that, that's true, that's true. It's really, what, it's really tied to what your potential outcome is, right? Yeah, but, but I think the positivity would apply like separately at each time point. Yeah, if you're focused just on each, each, each time point for the potential outcome. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Sure, that's, that's a good question. In fact, we should probably go back and think about this a bit more carefully, that, that particular assumption. Can I ask another one? No, no one else jumps in? Sure. So, so you could make this more personalized, right? Policy things is like everyone should take policy A or policy B, but you could like use your whole simulation technique to say for this person who's male and age in the, in the 50s and is height such and such, what you could just subset the outcomes for an individual person, right? Fairly easily within the technology you've built, right? So that might, yeah. I don't know how many, how big the interactions are implicit in your model, but you might get different answers for individuals. Right. So, so what we're, you know, what we hope for is, um, well, there's, this kind of gets back to the positivity again, though, actually. Uh, let's see. All right. So the one thing that I like about this BART technique is essentially, you know, it's a regularization strategy. Um, it uh, uses a, a sum, a large sum of, of small trees. So I think we're, you know, in the, I, don't, I don't, I can't speak to, the, to this in a really deep technical way, but I think there's some smoothness we're getting um, in the in the covariate space, so it's not like necessarily hard interactions. Um, but to look at like 
heterogeneous treatment effects or more personalized covariate specific treatment effects, it, it's going to be a lot of extrapolation. So if you just look at, for example, you know, people over 50 in a particular region, this model will, uh, you know, allow you to, to plug in those covariates and then simulate, say, um, the outcome under one treatment and the outcome under the other treatment. But then the question is like, do you, are you actually doing that based on data you have on those, on those people? Um, so I think some of the categories we want to do like personalized treatment effects or heterogeneous treatment effects, that's I think where it would be good to just find out like how much information are in these subcategories that you're, that you're looking at. Because the model will just generate the information. Um, and I guess it will, you know, in the posterior will appropriately quantify the uncertainty, but for example, if there's no women over 50 who initiate treatment, it will still give you a projected outcome for them, but I don't know what it would mean. So that's, I guess, with, with this machinery, this sort of G computation machinery, it's, it's, it's sort of, it is simple uh, conceptually, you know, because you're, you're just doing like a sequential prediction using fitted models. Um, but when you sort of let their turn this prediction process loose, there's nothing that tells you whether you're predicting outside the range of your data. Like if you're, yeah, if you're predicting for like covariate profiles that aren't very common. So um, yeah, I guess that's all I would really say about that. It's, it, it can be opaque that way. So it needs a little more, the, 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 if you go, if you use this for like sort of deeper investigation, like you're describing, I think understanding the subsets for whom you're doing predictions, like if they're well represented is probably good. Um, yeah. There might be ways to deal with this with a very big data set. There might be ways to deal with this with like oversampling some profiles uh, to get more information. So here, um, for S2, given all the past, uh, the treatments and the history, so that's BART, that's the um, yep. a multinomial BART. And for yep. the covariate X1, given all the past, obviously this generalized to all the time points. This is also another BART? It's another BART, yeah. Okay. But it's fit separately at every time point. Each of the BART models is fit separately at every time point. So an X1 here is univariate or uh, multivariate? Univariate. It's just the C4 count. Oh, I did C4 at say time one. So really the cover to, to individualize upon is a CD4 count, although you may have other information, say that's baseline or other non CD4 counts kind of uh, time dynamic kind of information you may use. Well, the, so <clears throat> this is one sort of complication we didn't take on. So we're, we only have one scalar covariate that varies over time. Um, if we had more than one, we'd have to build a multivariate model for that multivariate evolution of the covariates. But you could subset on, like V is baseline covariate. So if you want to look at treatment regimes for, you know, women over 50, uh, or for people who have to travel a long way at the clinic, you could subset the predictions that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, from the overall, I would say to do it from the overall fitted model. In other words, I wouldn't fit separate models for these subgroups, but from the overall fitted model, I could pick a subset of the Vs and look at, you know, look at them, for example. Okay. Um, subsetting on the X, that's time varying, might be a little bit tricky. Um, I don't know an obvious way to do that. Like at a particular time, you could subset on the X, but the but X is determining the treatment that you're gonna get next mm -hmm. in the dynamic setup. Well, you didn't tell us, what was time zero here? What was, the, um, in what sense, Jeremy? What's time zero, if it's new, new people, Newly diagnosed with HIV infection? Yes, yes, newly diagnosed, uh, treatment naive. And we, we picked them up at their first uh, visit to the clinic. 
for the A clinic. Well, I'm happy to keep ask, asking questions, but I don't want to hog the show here. Yeah, I can't see the whole screen of people. I don't know, but uh, yeah, happy to keep going. So there's this, you know, this method, the, you know, time sequential inverse probability weighting that Miguel Hernan has used and others for this sort of project, this type of project. I don't know if you can deal with multi-state models as you, you can, but do you have any sense of uh, benefit of your sort of more prospective modeling based rather than just sort of empirical inverse probability based and they have they have to fit models to calculate the probability of being on treatment at any time right which you don't right to to. so um that so one one distinction is that uh it's like what what do you have to model so as far as just like you know what you have to do for this approach you have to model the covariance so that's a, that could be a, a you know, if, you're, if you have a lot of time varying, you don't have to model the baseline covariance, but you have to model time varying covariance. So that could be uh, a significant undertaking if you have a lot of them. Whereas with inverse probability weighting, you don't have to model the covariance, but you do have to model probability of receiving treatment at any given time conditional on the time varying covariance. So it's sort of like picking your poison in a way. Um, as far as like the machinery you have to build. Um, the thing I like about this though is, so first of all, I just like, I, I like likelihoods. <laughs> so, um, you know, <clears throat> I, I feel comfortable when I can write down a probability model for how the data are being generated and I can write down posteriors that tell me how the parameters are informed from the data and the prior. So that's just me. Not everybody operates that way, but um, so the fitting of the models here, uh, the predictive models, it's all likelihood based. So um, then you're going to generate, the other thing I like about it is that because the G computation algorithm asks you to generate predictions, that that's really what it is. I mean, it, it's represented as an integral, but the way you do the integral is to, you know, fit these distributions and then use predictions from them to do the averaging over time. And I guess the other thing I like about a likelihood-based framework, and particularly Bayesian framework here, is that it, it, it properly is going to prop, if you believe the predictions and you believe your assumptions, which is a big if, but um, it's going to propagate the uncertainty in a way that's understandable. So, uh, because it because I'll just take step back for one second. Both IPW and G computation are actually fitting the same causal structural model. The the the, the, the model they have in mind is the same model. Um, in fact, uh, if I go back, I know it's a very compact way to write it, but. This is the causal model. It's the probability distribution under some regime of the outcome at the last time point versus under some other regime. Like this is this is basically is a causal structural model. So the target for both IPW and G computation is the same. When I do G computation, I'm doing it sort of in an extrapolation based way. I'm kind of assuming, you know, if everyone in the population got this regime, I'm going to predict what would happen versus if everyone in the population got this other regime, I'm going to predict what happens. And what makes it causal is that I start with the same X's for both regimes. You know, I start with my list of X's for those 10,000 people and I predict what would happen if they got treated immediately. I go back to those same 10,000, I generate posterior predictive distribution under the dynamic regime, and then I can just compare the posterior distributions. Um, so with inverse probability weighting, though, um, there, I mean, I guess there, there's ways to frame this so that it's a likelihood, but it's really, it's not a likelihood. It's sort of a two-step estimation procedure. You know, first you estimate weights, um, 
and then you take those estimated weights and you're essentially at each time point, you're gonna reweight the people that are still in follow-up in such a way that the covariates for people on treatment are equally represented in a way for the, uh, the have the same sort of distribution as they do for people off treatment. So you're, you're gonna just like reweight your sample every time and then do whatever estimation technique you wanna do it could even be moment-based. Um, so I think if the inverse probability weighting is not really based on a likelihood. It's, it's based on a, you know, we're going to reweight the sample to sort of make the X distributions equal for the two regimes. So, um, you know, I don't know if there's one that's better than the other. Uh, there's not a, there's not a, people have worked on trying to find likelihood-based analogs for IPW. Um, there's been a little bit of progress on that, but it's not, I don't think they're directly comparable like in a likelihood-based framework. If you take yourself out of likelihood-based framework, you've probably heard of these like double robust methods and things like that, which is basically at each time point you do some, essentially it's like a weighted average of the IPW estimate and the imputation estimate and you, you know, do some fancy way of combining those two things. Uh, but again, that's not likelihood based. It's it's uh, it's just based on reweighting a sample. So I don't know. So maybe so so that I, I think I understand how the mechanics of them work. As a matter of taste, I just feel like if I don't know how something is working, at least I know how likelihood inference works. So I really feel secure when I'm working with a likelihood. I feel a lot less secure when I'm working with inverse probability weights and things like that. So I don't know. So I'm sorry to jump in. I just wanted to note, Joe, that there is some work that's been done. Uh, Rod and, and I have been working with uh, some students on these um, penalized prime propensity models where you actually, you know, you, you, you put the propensity and not as a weight, but as a predictor. Yes, I, and, I'm uh, actually aware of that work, Michael. I'm sorry for not mentioning it, but yeah, go yeah, ahead. No, that, that's fine, but I, I think that is a, is a way to, to kind of get around that. The other thing that I've done along those lines, another student is, is really just more in the, in the missing data framework, it's a little easier, but it could be carried over, I think, in this other setting, is uh, sort of looking at, at using BART to deal with misspecification in those things. So even if, you know, so doubly robust, if both models are wrong, you know, there's that work that, that uh, Joe Hogan and Kang have done that, that showed the, um, you know how badly things can go off, and and uh, and well, so not Joe, not Joe Hogan, Joe uh, Sha uh, Joe Schaefer. 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 I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, got I know that paper too, I, but I know I haven't done that work. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> I, I so um, yeah. So that's uh, so so our work um, basically showed that using Bart to deal with the prediction side and using and using that on the. Um, and, and then, you know, putting that in, in like a spline or some kind of, you know, non permeable way was probably better than trying to just gut your way out with BART on the, on the, on the modeling, you know, so it's sort of more of the G computation approach, but that was in a, you know, in a limited context and, and pretty much, you know, a, a function of our simulations really, but, but, um, but I don't know if that's an, an alternative to sort of think about in these settings. Yeah, I, I think it is actually. So I became aware of, of that work through EGEN, my, the student I mentioned before. Um, so, you know, it'll probably make you happy to know, it's, you know, Scott Zeger told her, you know, read this paper and there's a big discussion. Uh, either you guys, it was your paper that was discussed or was it? Yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was a discussion with. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so um, the other paper I'm talking about is, is much less well known. It's in it's in in the missing data literature and survey setting. But. Okay. So yeah, this is uh, so I guess yeah I'm I'm aware of the work and I'm I'm sort of just starting to work my way through it myself. Uh, if that's you know I wish I could speak a little bit more fluently about it. Um, I guess the the other, the other thing that uh, uh, Mike Daniels and Jason Roy are working on, which I think is also along the same lines, is you know, they just say, take everything in sight and model it non-parametrically using a Bayesian likelihood. Um, mm -hmm. They use like, you know, essentially these turn out to be high dimensional mixtures of distributions we know about. So you could think about like a high dimensional mixture of normal distributions or something. There's still a likelihood there. And so they're, you know, this is something I, I, I talk with Mike on a pretty regular basis. And one, you know, one thing that 
another philosophy here is to say like, well, let's just put a likelihood on everything inside and the joint distribution of all the data. And once you have that, you can back out anything you want. You know, right? In other words, like if you, if you can take the effort to model the joint distribution of everything in sight, then just take any sort of conditional distribution or anything you want from that, and you can just generate posterior predictions. So I think as a philosophical approach, it seems appealing, but I think in like to apply it in this setting, <laughs> yes. it would be a heavy lift. So yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. But I think that I would say that sort of thing is what, I, what this approach espouses a little bit um, in the sense that we try to be as flexible as possible modeling things we can see. Um, and then, then use the, those very, very flexible models to extrapolate things that the causal model asks us to extrapolate. And uh, so that's the, I think that, that's, that philosophy sort of permeates this paper. Although when I talk with Mike, you know, he talks about these like sort of distributions of things that I, I can't, I'm having trouble even envisioning them in my head because uh, yeah. they're, they're so general, but. Um, no, I think it's really cool. And I think it's amazing. You've also got the BART with the, with the multinomial because multinomial is a nightmare. It's a nightmare. And I'd say like, so um, this paper is a little bit overripe. It's very technical. Um, Ejin is on like her third iteration of it, third revision, but it's, I think we're going to be sending it out. Um, I mean, I, I, I could have said imminently last month too, but it's, it's very, very close. And it's a very nice piece of work. Um, uh, so I'm looking forward to, to seeing it get, get, get it, get out somewhere. You know, I, I, I think that I've, I've read a couple of papers on multinomial BART and I think that, uh, people who have dug into this will probably appreciate how difficult the problem is. Um, yeah, yeah it's, it's definitely tricky. Chair, I guess I, I agree. I like your philosophy of modeling, but sort of observable process, not, not using this probably way. It's not a bit of experience with trying to sort of do time dependent waiting to solve this problem is very unstable, very hard to get good models for the time dependent weights. I don't know. But I, I mean, I imagine your models aren't easy. I mean, you, you got missing data to deal with too here. Presumably you've got lots of practical complications here in terms of getting your models to work properly. Yeah. <laughs> We punted on a couple of data issues. Like, you know, if you see like the CD4 isn't measured at every time point. So it's hard to know, like, is it missing or is it just like infrequently measured? We sort of, you know, uh, let's see if we, but this is, again, we did, we, when, you, when, you, when you grapple with something like this, you have to decide which things you're willing to take shortcuts on, I guess, or you'd never get anything done. Um, but you know, you notice that these intervals, like here's, we basically analyze the data at these 200 day intervals, even though the data are coming in at sort of a continuous stream. So what do, what's the CD4 count at time 600? Well, we have a rule that says like, number one, was it measured? And number two, if it was measured, what's the most recent measure? So that's kind of how we're quantifying the CD4 evolution. Like, is it there? And if it was there, what is it? But we don't, sort of model it and you know we don't try to impute what happened in between um yeah and you know it's not anything that's going to wind up in a missing data textbook but that's uh as a practical matter that's what we did there okay well if uh there's no more questions uh our, our discussion has slowly dwindled, I think. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, this discussion makes me really sad that I, you know, wasn't able to, you know, sit in people's offices. I think hopefully, you know, we're, we're going to be there soon. Um, uh, so, but thank you really very, very much. It's, uh, this has been great. Been, the individual meetings were good and I really appreciate the feedback. Um, it's been a really nice visit. This is a department I have, I feel like I have some affinity with and uh, it's nice to, to see you all. Yeah, thank you so much for speaking. Nice to see you, all right, bye. Okay, take care.
Be well, everybody.